Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the April gardening checklist video. I do one of these uh, each month for the things I have going on uh, in my yard. I'm kind of uh, in the middle of most uh, gardening areas in the country because I'm in zone 7B in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, those of you who are in zone five or six would be doing the things I'm talking about probably a few weeks behind me. And those of you who are in zone eight and nine probably should get on some of these things that I'm talking about if you haven't, if you haven't yet. Uh, my average last frost date is the middle of April, right around April 15th. And uh, so I'm cautious with putting out any kind of summer annuals or summer color. Uh, as you're shopping right now, you'll probably see some of those things creeping into the uh, garden centers and the box stores and those places. And it is too early uh, uh, for me to be putting those things out. I would say though that uh, uh, tree and shrub wise, this is a great time to be planting those things. And this is probably the best selection we're gonna have uh, in 2021, potentially, it is going to be a, there's definitely a scarcity of plants. So many people, so many new gardeners came into gardening last year uh, that there's definitely a shortage. I am cautious about buying uh, trees and shrubs that have a lot of new growth on them. Uh, you know, before my frost free date, I assume that they came either from a much warmer place than where I live or they've been forced in a house. I'm not saying don't buy them though, because this, this year, uh, you probably do want to acquire things uh, regardless. I've got a collection of some things back here that are a little bit ahead that are uh, acquired from warmer areas, but I'm not putting them in the ground. I'm leaving them mobile so I can protect them between now and my uh, average last frost date, which is April 15th. I won't put any of my summer vegetables, uh, summer color uh, baskets, um, putting in new containers for summer, that kind of thing. Not only until April 15th, but I'll also be looking at the 10 day forecast because it's an average last frost date. So I, I've seen frequently where even towards the beginning of May, you know, we can get a, uh, we can get a frost and uh, a lot of those things just they're not forgiving uh, at all. But otherwise, it's time to go for it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll be planting tons of trees and shrubs in the ground uh, during the uh, month of April. I've got huge plans and by the end of April, I'll have all of my summer color in the ground as well. And while we're talking about summer color, you don't have to rely on the garden centers and the box stores to provide all of that for you. You can start a lot of those things from seed and there's plenty of uh, seed available now for all of your summer flowering things and flowering bulbs. And I would go ahead and get those things acquired now. And that can be like things like dahlia tubers uh, and uh, elephant ears and those kinds of things. Get them sooner than later. Uh, otherwise, uh, they're going to be they're going to probably disappear off the shelves pretty quickly. I have a video from a couple weeks ago uh, back here starting my uh, dahlias early, starting my dahlia tubers. Uh, much less expensive method, just buying the tubers, putting them in a pot, growing them out for a week or two before I put them in the ground. I do have to protect them between now and my uh, frost free date, but I'm getting a jump start on those. If you want to go back and look at that video. And this is probably the best selection of fruit plants uh, you're gonna have uh, during the year. So fruit trees and fruiting uh, shrubs and vines, uh, uh, this is probably gonna be the best chance to acquire those things. So if you're interested in adding those things into your garden, and that can be asparagus and strawberries even, and blackberries and blueberries, I'd probably get to shopping for those things pretty quickly. A couple things I like to think about on my uh, summer color is I like to do my own hanging baskets and uh, plant my own containers. And if I do that by buying, either buying six packs, you know, small plants or uh, growing them out from seed on my own, I find that number one, I save money uh, and I can recycle the uh, hanging baskets every year. Uh, but number two, uh, buying completely finished baskets uh, that are just full and full of flowers in the middle of April Unless you're planning on planting them up into a larger basket sometime during the summer, they're going to get tired uh, pretty quickly. And I find that they're just fading out by uh, early, you know, early summer every year. So uh, consider, doing your, consider doing your own baskets. It's getting really late to uh, transplant uh, plants in the ground. Uh, if you need to move something from one place to another, uh, the closer we get to summer, the worst idea that probably is. And uh, the best time is usually when things are completely dormant. But uh, if you're in colder areas and there's something you want to move, I would get on that job. I would get on that task pretty quickly. Uh, pruning uh, is always something that that we spend lots of time uh, talking about in the uh, spring. The uh, things that flower uh, here in the early spring, uh, right after they flower, you can go ahead and prune them if you need to do, you know, give them a haircut. Uh, this is probably a good time of year to give things a, kind of a reset after they flower. So things like azaleas, you know, right after they finish flowering, if they need to go way back 
this would be the time to do it. Other spring flowering things, uh, be super, super careful about when you prune them. Uh, it, you can, uh, as a rule, if you'll just prune things after they flower, uh, you'll be fine. If there's things that you need to uh, get under control, if you don't care whether or not you get flowers on something and it's more important to take it down, I would take it down sooner than later. Again, that's another job that's more stressful the closer we get uh, towards summer. A couple other things to consider when uh, shopping for plants uh, right now in the spring. I say this all the time. Be careful not to go into the garden centers and buy every shrub that's in full bloom uh, in April uh, and then fill up your whole yard that way. Otherwise, you're just going to have a yard that just blooms out every spring. I see tons of these kinds of yards where people just shop for plants in, you know, in April and May. And I can tell, uh, you know, uh, save, some, save some spaces. Come back to the garden centers in July and uh, you know, August and September and buy a couple pieces here and there. And you can have a yard that you know, is more of a four season uh, yard, hopefully. And the other thing to think about is uh, pollinators. And uh, you can use native plants for that. Uh, but um, you know, thinking about plants that uh, will invite uh, uh, butterflies and, and bees into your yard can uh, be quite a bit more enjoyment in your, bring quite a bit more enjoyment into your landscape. The so swinging back around uh, to pruning, I talked about something like azaleas where they bloom. Uh, after they bloom, you can really cut them back hard. You know, this would be the time to do that with hollies and you know, any, anything that you really need to get under control. The earlier in the season uh, you can do that, the better. Uh, plants that have root suckers, you know, take something like a forsythia, for example, where it, the, the plant can start coming up, you know, many feet from the original plant where you planted it. This is the time to go ahead and chop those root suckers off. It's usually pretty easy with a shovel just to cut them off uh, right below the base and kind of get that plant back to where you had actually originally wanted wanted it to be in the first place. And then uh, all of your just general cleanup on your plants. As they're waking back up, um, we had some areas of the country that got really, really cold this winter. As things are waking back up, you'll know where to cut those things that were severely damaged back to uh, at that point when you start seeing the new growth. And just in general, uh, as things are waking up in the spring, you're gonna see dead limbs on things, uh, you know, where it went to sleep and that part of the plant didn't wake back up. So it's time to get back on, you know, cleaning those things up. If you haven't pruned back your butterfly bushes yet, um, it's time to do that. I have a video on my channel for, for, for that. Ornamental grasses get, um, we're almost at the time where the new growth is starting on them. If you've got a lot of new growth on them already, it's almost too late to cut them back. Uh, but if you're not seeing new growth down at the bottom, it's time to go back and you know cut all your ornamental grasses back. If a plant is not making you happy, sometimes it's just time for that plant to go. If it's something that you, kn that you know you have to spray all season or something you have to constantly work on um, to make it, uh, you know, where, where, it keep, where it's keeping you happy. If you, it's something you're having to water five times more than something else, if it's something that gets insect and disease problems every season, take it out of the ground <laughs> and go find something that makes you happy. Uh, and, and again, that's kind of tough for people sometimes uh, to, to, to hear and to do. Uh, but trust me when I say that uh, problem plants and, prob and plants that you have to spend way more time on than every other thing in your yard, once they're gone and something's back in that spot, um, uh, gardening is much more enjoyable that way. It's definitely time to fertilize your trees and shrubs, ground covers, perennials. Uh, if you haven't done so already, I put up a video several weeks back of doing mine. I use an organic fertilizer every year. Uh, one of the main reasons I use it is because it feeds the soil and then the, lets the soil feed the plants. And uh, it, you really have less chance of burning your plants that way. I only do it once a year. And uh, the rest of the things that my, the, the rest of the way I'm feeding the plants is I'm keeping the ground covered with mulch and that mulch is breaking down and uh, helping feed the plants that way. Uh, that mulch also becomes uh, more and more important here during the spring. We're about to have all the spring weeds uh, germinating. Of course, all the winter weeds, which I just did a video on about all the identifying all the uh, winter weeds, um, you know, they're going crazy right now. Uh, if you can get those out and get the ground covered uh, with mulch now, you can prevent a lot of those summer weeds from, uh, you know, coming up in your bed right here. You know, when soil temperature hits a certain temperature, each of these weeds start to germinate. So really important to have the ground covered. Uh, right here going into spring and the other thing as it gets hotter and hotter and hotter toward the end of spring and into summer that mulch is going to help hold in moisture it's going to help moderate the soil temp the root temperatures uh, on your plants and you'll see growth you know much further into summer uh, with well mulched uh, garden spaces 
And speaking of watering, you know, we're, we're, we're in April and lots of us are getting, uh, you know, plenty of rain uh, this time of year. So you're not thinking about irrigation, but if you're doing a lot of bed planning and new installations and that kind of thing, and you think you're going to want to put in irrigation, you may want to be planning that now. I put drip irrigation down uh, in this yard uh, last year as I was constructing it. That's the easiest time of the year to do it. Of course, if you already have existing irrigation systems, it's going to be time to be checking those things out, make sure they're, fun you know, survive the winter well and are functioning so that when it comes later in the spring and early summer and you have to start watering, uh, you'll be ready to do that. As your landscape starts to uh, reawaken and your perennials that died to the ground last winter start to come back up, uh, this would be the time that you can pop some of them out of the ground and cut them and divide them into other spaces if you want to. Another thing that can happen is during the winter when they're asleep, uh, they spread outward some and when they come back up they're in a much larger place than they were and I call those perennial bullies. You probably want to get those back under control uh, as they're emerging from the ground into the space that you want to uh, keep them in. The other thing is your spring bulbs will be, you know, they've been blooming for me, you know, things like daffodils and hyacinths and uh, those kinds of things that have been blooming here for the last month in my area. Uh, as they start to fade, uh, I want to uh, mark the spots that they're in or map the spots that they're in so that as I'm doing additional planting and uh, jobs during the year, I don't want to be digging my bulbs up. The other thing is we want to keep that foliage uh, on those bulbs uh, and let the, let the foliage die back uh, to the ground on its own. That's how the bulb kind of recharges itself uh, for next year. I don't have just a map of where my bulbs are. I have a map of where every tree and shrub is uh, in the yard because I do forget the uh, specific varieties uh, at times and I need to go back and reference that. So I encourage you to write you know, everything down really because our memories get worse uh, you know, as, as, as we age here for sure. Uh, one of the things that's easier to do than it is any other time of the year is bed edging. Uh, April, because the ground is still a little bit wet, it's super easy to go back around your turf uh, and, and redefine it all. Uh, while the ground's a little moist. If you try to do this job in July when the ground's just you know dry and crusty, it's a much harder, much harder proposition. I've got warm season grass in my yard. It has started to get some color back in it. It's starting to wake back up. I'm going to fertilize it here uh, during the month of April. Uh, this is the time of year that uh, lawn maintenance wise, uh, cool season lawns and warm season lawns kind of have things to do in them. And it's definitely time to fertilize both. And uh, if you're gonna do any overseeding, of your cool season or warm season grass the sooner you can do that uh, the better on the cool season grass i'll wait toward the end of the month if i was going to overseed my bermuda or centipede or zoysia grass or whatever it was i sodded this last year and you can go back and watch that uh, sodding video uh, if you're interested in learning how to you know lay sod in your own in your own yard but again as this starts to wake up after my frost free date um, I will fertilize this lawn. I don't want to push it uh, too early. I don't want to push a lot of new growth on it with the potential for a couple more frost. Some of my summer vegetables, I start from seed uh, inside the house. Uh, that's going to be tomatoes and uh, peppers. Uh, but a lot of things I direct seed uh, into the garden. Any of those summer vegetables, I'm not putting into that vegetable garden until after my average last frost rate. And then still again, looking at that 10 day forecast. So sometime by the end of April, uh, my tomatoes and peppers and, uh, and those kinds of things will be going in the ground. I direct seed my cucumbers, squash, zucchini, and beans uh, at that time. So sometime around then. Thinking through your vegetable garden, I did a video several weeks back about refreshing my garden for the year and I put down a layer of compost. At that time, I planted broccoli and lettuce and some cool season vegetables, which are over there. They've taken off here in the last couple weeks since that was done. Uh, I'm going to plug right into there toward the end of April my summer vegetables. Some things to think about. It's best to rotate your vegetables around if you can. I don't have as great an opportunity uh, in this particular landscape as I would like to. I'm on two tenths of an acre in an urban space, and I only have one sunny strip over here. And so I would prefer to literally pack up and move my tomatoes to the other side of the yard. I just don't get enough sun over here. If you have that opportunity and you can, I would have two separate, you know, completely separate spaces. Things to be thinking about with a vegetable garden, especially if you're doing it for the first time. Uh, the vegetables will go kind of wild and, and you can, hopefully you have a great year with it and you're going to get tons of food out of it. People tend to overplant. They plant things too close together 
and then you end up with lots and lots of food but over the long haul the plants end up suffering and you don't get you don't get them for a very long time okay uh, trust me from experience you're better spacing the plants properly than you are cramming them in there and seeing how much food you can grow in the tiniest amount of space you can because you'll end up with leaf spot issues, insect problems, all kinds of problems. Space them properly. I promise the plants will hold up better during the summer and your yield will last longer uh, uh, over the course of the summer. A few other things to think about uh, in the vegetable garden. Number one, when I put down, when I put in my warm season vegetables toward the end of April, I'll definitely uh, fertilize that space at that time with some sort of organic fertilizer. Between the uh, one application of fertilizer and the compost, that should be plenty adequate for the season. Uh, consider stagger planting your summer vegetable crop, meaning that you can plant some in late April and then you can come back in late May and do the same thing and that will definitely extend your yield uh, further into the summer uh, to do it that way. If you plant them all at one time, you tend to get them all at one time and it overwhelms you uh, and, uh, and honestly becomes not fun. Uh, some, some years, if you, you, know, you have piles and piles of things that you can't eat fast as, fat, as fast as they can come out of the garden. And one more point on uh, planting too early, uh, even if the air temperature is warm enough, if the soil temperature is not, uh, it can definitely stunt things like tomatoes and peppers. And so again, just wait, uh, ju just wait. No matter how tempting it is, uh, I've, I've been burned by this enough. Uh, I, I, something planted at the proper time in late April versus something planted uh, early in April that gets some cold nights on it and the soil stays cold. I've seen those newer planted plants just fly past them uh, by the end of May. I just recently put up a video on uh, how to grow potatoes in grow bags. You may want to go back and take a look at that. Growing potatoes is super rewarding and pretty easy uh, when done in this grow bag technique, um, growing them in compost and pine bark. And uh, again, if you, even if you're not growing a lot of vegetables or you haven't yet you haven't or you're scared to tackle it or whatever trust me this potato thing in the grow bags super rewarding uh, every year the other thing is make sure you're writing down all the varieties that you're planting into the vegetable garden you'll find uh, i think last year i had i don't know uh, 15 varieties of tomatoes and uh, just remembering you know remembering what I had planted and where I had planted, I was able to cull out about five of those that I just didn't like as much uh, and then add, you know, and I'm trying five or six new ones uh, this year. Uh, it's very helpful. Uh, otherwise, you know, you just can't remember uh, from year to year what varieties are your favorites. Be cautious when you're transitioning your house plants uh, back outside. Uh, same thing with our, you know, my average last frost date being mid-April. I don't want to take my uh, house plants out too early. The other thing about taking your house plants from inside to out, if you take them from you know, a low light situation in your living room and you pop them out in the full sun one afternoon in late April, uh, the leaves can get severely burned. So transition them slowly uh, back out into the sunlight outside, maybe time to uh, up pot um, all of those things. And the other thing is looking around the yard, you know, cleaning up bird feeders and bird houses and, uh, you know, just, just, general, uh, just general cleanup. We've had a lot of storms recently, so I've got a lot of, you know, sticks and debris around the yard that I'm, uh, that I'm cleaning up. And, you know, there's just a lot, there tends to be a lot of that uh, during the month of April. So I'm going to finish up the April garden checklist video by talking about something I frequently talk about, and that is visiting other landscapes walking around your community, seeing things that are blooming here in the spring uh, and things that you, you know, things that you might want to duplicate in your yard, visiting botanical gardens and public gardens. Uh, that's a lot of fun. Of course, they're springing to life uh, here. The uh, J.C. Ralston Arboretum, which had been closed for most of 2020, is now open in the afternoons in Raleigh. And it's just a great place for me to go and uh, see things that, um, that I wouldn't just be able to see anywhere else. Not even at a garden center, not at box stores or any place else. Um, I can see combinations. I can see height combinations. I can see texture combinations, color combinations on foliage. Super, super interesting and uh, can give you a lot of ideas for your own landscape and your own garden uh, during uh, 2021. Thank you guys for following along with these uh, monthly checklist videos. Uh, I'll be back at the beginning of May uh, with the uh, May Garden Checklist. Thanks for watching.